to the TUT Today's organ donation. Um, I always approach talks on this on how we can actually get better at it. Um, so that's an underlying uh, uh, theme through the talk, which you'll see. But we'll also cover the basics that you need to know for exams. Um, so what we're going to cover in this talk is where does South Africa stand and how does our system work? Who can be considered a donor? How do we certify brain death correctly? What is donation after cardiac death or circulatory death, as the correct term is? How do you approach a grieving family? When should you refer to the transplant team? And how is a donor managed? How are the organs allocated? And how do we get better? So where does South Africa stand? Well, apart from the COVID pandemic, we're actually quite nicely situated um, at the bottom of Africa. And historically, we're well positioned, having done the first heart transplant in 1967. However, if you look at the total number of transplants in South Africa as a country, and this is just sort of a 20 year retrospective review, we average around about 330 transplants, the vast majority being kidney transplants each year, and half of those are from living donors. And there you can see that the bottom of the a smaller number of heart transplants, liver transplants, and lung and multi-organ transplants. In that same time period of that graph, our population grew by 29%, from 36 million to 50 million. We're now another 5 million more than that. There's also been a shift in transplantation activity from the state service to the private sector. And that was very pronounced over this time period when in 2011 we didn't do any heart transplants in the state sector. Um, we have re recuperated the heart program um, and also started a lung transplant program at Fortescue since 2016, 2017. Um, and here you can see that uh, there was a consistent number of liver transplants, but it was not growing. And the, the advent of a private setup in Johannesburg, you can see that the need actually does exist. Um, and has been, uh, they've had a remarkable growth in their program. Um, having said that, the, that liver transplant program growth is partly driven by an aggressive living donor program, which we don't have in our liver program in, in Cape Town. Um, and what has been happening across all the stats is there's a decreased number of deceased donors. And that's going to be a major focus of this talk because this is where ICU can potentially assist to make sure that no donor referrals are potentially missed. So how do you keep country but uh, keep score between countries? Well, you look at the donation rate per million population, okay, the number of donors. So if you look at Spain, they clock in with about 36 donors per million population. USA, 25 per million. UK gets 18 per million. Brazil, sort of our level economy, manages to get 14 per million. A tiny country like Costa Rica gets about four per million. What do we think South Africa has? We have 1.4 donors per million population. So we are not good at deceased donation in this country, despite our history. Now, why that is, we can have some discussion around that. Our system is opt-in, so it's similar to the American consent system. We need informed consent from the patient's family. Okay, so being on the organ donor registry is not taken as informed consent. So your family will always be approached to consent. Even in countries such as Spain, where they have presumed consent, they always routinely approach the family and have about an 18% refusal rate in Spain. We've got hospital-based transplant coordinators, so they're not functioning like in America with an organ procurement organization, and then the hospitals have to contact by law, and they're working within hospitals. It's completely non-incentivized, so no money is changing hands. We're not allowed to assist with funeral costs. Um, so it's completely altruistic. The organs are allocated to an urgent national list for liver, heart, and lungs. There's no real dialysis option to indefinitely maintain these patients. So there's a never-ending stream of urgent listings coming across. Um, and then kidneys are allocated within the province of the donor. So we've got no money changing hands and no OPO or organ procurement organization doing it and then billing the hospital for the organs that they receive. So how do we actually motivate people to put donors into the pool? Well, what happens is the, the, the healthcare system that does the work for the deceased donor and managing them, handling the referral, um, gets allocated one of the kidneys to the top of their waiting list. Okay, so if a donor is at Kruderskir, one of the kidneys will be allocated to the patient who's been waiting the longest is the best match on our waiting list. And then the other kidney is actually allocated to the top of a combined public-private uh, waiting list um, to whoever's been waiting the longest in the province um, and is the best match for, for that kidney. Okay.
So that's how we sort of balance the book. So if your hospital does a lot of work, it's not going to be trumped because there's an urgent call from this, that, and that center that, that, that then get the organs allocated. You'd always get at least a kidney out of the deal. But it doesn't motivate hospitals that don't have transplant programs. So if you don't have a transplant program, what is your motivation to put in donors? So our system's not very good at, at, at ensuring donors come from all hospitals. In Krudeske, in 20, this, this, this slide changes. So last year, 2019, we had 18 donors at Krudeske Hospital. So it's not just a question of, uh, we'll get the next one. Um, they are very few and far between, and we need to make sure we don't miss an opportunity to identify a potential donor. So if we had to go, how do we get better? It's by identifying all potential donors and maximizing the chances of getting consent, because those are the two drop-offs. We don't have many referrals, and we have a very low consent rate. So who can be a donor? Well, it depends on what you're donating, okay? So corneas, the donor can be up to 70 years old, and it's independent of the mechanism of death. To be an organ donor, you would have to die um, having been on a mechanical ventilator at some point, okay? Um, but for tissues, uh, um, uh, corneas, tendons, um, it, it's independent of the mechanism of death, and there's a bigger window of time to recover those organs. So up to 12 hours after death, you can recover a cornea with the, with the eye bank. For a heart, uh, what I want to say here is that it's not the whole package of the donor. It's an individual assessment of each organ that uh, allows us to assess whether it can be successfully transplanted. And that's also a risk balance ratio between the recipient. So if someone's, if there's a child at Red Cross with fulminant liver failure with only 12 hours to live without a transplant, potentially the window, they would take a more compromised organ in, in, in terms of trying to ensure their survival because not getting a transplant is uniformly fatal. Um, so, so the goalpost does shift on the urgency of the patient waiting. And the important thing is we would accept a hypertensive or a diabetic. We'd potentially get an angiogram in the donor to assess the heart if it was a 45-year-old diabetic. And then we'd make an assessment on the organ individually to say whether it could be successfully transplanted. Uh, it's a combination of multiple factors. So the distance involved in the transplant would also come in because that impacts the cold ischemic time. Um, and various other factors get factored into those decisions. The biggest thing to understand is the goalposts for renal transplantation are absolutely huge. And I'll go through a list of things, but basically if you put a kidney into someone and it doesn't work straight away, you can dialyze them and wait for that kidney to work, okay? So if it's at the end of life and the creatinine's gone up to 290, um, but the patient's had a severe head injury, um, we can successfully transplant those kidneys and put them into a happy home. And if they have a chance of recovering in a patient, they have the potential to recover in another patient as well. So it's important to realize that extended criteria donors are a big deal. There's no age limit. Comorbidities are allowed. Infections which can be treated. A recipient who's waiting on average more than five years for a deceased donor kidney will gladly accept a little bit of syphilis with their organ if they just have to take a penicillin injection three times and they get a, a successful transplant. And then donation after circulatory arrest is also a category of extended criteria donors, but we'll discuss that a little bit more. So this is a, a newspaper article from the UK where it was a neonate who was born and they were certified uh, brain dead because they were born without a brain. Um, and they transplanted both the kidneys into an adult. Transplanting kidneys from such a young donor is very risky in terms of the vascular complications are higher. Um, and what you typically do in that situation is you actually transplant both kidneys into a single adult recipient because they're like more likely to tolerate the operation than trying to uh, put them into a smaller recipient. And you need to transplant sufficient nephrons in order for the kidneys to actually um, grow and successfully cope with, with the metabolic load once they're transplanted. And why are we talking so much about extended criteria donors? Well, it's because there's so many people dying on the waiting list. So in New York, before COVID, every 15 hours, a New Yorker dies waiting for an organ, okay? In South Africa, we have over 4,300 people waiting for transplants, 5% of whom die each year, and 6% of whom are transplanted. And if you look at five-year mortality on a dialysis program, it approaches 50%. And if you're waiting on average more than five years for your transplant, you might as well flip a coin at the start of your diagnosis of renal failure and dialysis as to whether you're going to get to a deceased donor kidney. 
So being transplanted, a marginal organ offers a significant survival benefit over no transplant at all. So we transplant HIV positive kidneys into HIV positive recipients. We would take a renal impairment of up to 300 in a brain dead donor and successfully transplant those kidneys and get good outcomes. Elderly kidneys are allocated to elderly recipients. So older than 50 donors go into older than 50 recipients under our allocation program. Hepatitis B to hepatitis B, in block kidney transplants from very young donors, treatable infections I've mentioned before, and low risk malignancies. Brain tumors typically don't cross the blood brain barrier. They're well known risk algorithms, okay? You don't want to transplant a malignancy into someone who's going to be immunosuppressed because that cancer just then runs rampant. Um, but brain tumors, uh, and depending on the grades, and quite often that's a judgment call made, um, are able to be donors. This is just to show you where the kidneys actually go. So kidneys go into the iliac vessels because that's nice and close to the bladder and you don't want a really long ureter because then you end up with ureteric complications. Um, and they actually get put in the subcutaneous tissue just by the iliac tissue. So under, under the muscle, but, but just there under the skin. And you're not allowed to go play contact sports if you've got a kidney transplant. So there's two ways to be dead. This is where it starts to get to exam type questions. And uh, if you're doing medicine, you do need to be certain of how to diagnose death. So you can either be certified brain dead, or you could have no spontaneous circulatory output. Um, and typically a time period of five minutes is used for that because then it's deemed that there would be uh, naturally irrevocable neurological harm at that point. Okay. The dead donor rule is also very important to, to, to be aware of. So all organ donors are clinically dead before any organs are recovered, and the transplant team is not involved in the dying process. So we rely on the clinical team to maintain management of that donor, but that's not to say that you can't have pragmatic discussions with the family and make an assessment of the donation potential by discussing the case with the transplant team prior to the patient dying. Um, it can't happen after the fact because then the time frame is too rushed. So we're trying to get people to just discuss earlier and different countries use different triggers. So in the UK, if your GCS is five and under, not explained by sedation, it's actually mandated that you need to have some sort of discussion around end of life care. Not everyone dies from that situation, but it's, the t it, it's definitely a trigger to start having pragmatic discussions um, and being aware of what all the options are. Um, and it's very good to clarify the potential for donation so that in your discussions with the family, you don't inadvertently say something that would undermine the entire process. So let's just cover donation after circulatory uh, arrest as an example. So that a patient who's expected to die upon withdrawal of life support can potentially donate lungs, liver, kidneys, and pancreas. And if you want to get into an ethical area, potentially heart too. This is being done in two centers under strict ethical controls. Um, informed consent is always required from the family. There needs to be close coordination with the transplant team. And that's because the procurement operation needs to happen immediately upon certification, okay? So there's no time once the heart has stopped beating to then ask the family to then book theater. And I'll take you through the actual scenario. So you've got a patient with a catastrophic stroke, GCS of three, but preserved corneal and cough reflexes and the odd spontaneous gasping respiration. The decisions made with the family to withdraw life support, okay, and an organ donation is discussed in the family consents. It's a, uh, one of the ways to ask this is what would this patient have wanted to have come from this situation? You don't want to make it feel like the family's responsible for the death, um, and there's a, a very definite art that we're going to discuss later about how do you actually make the best possible approach to the family. In this situation, if the family uh, says the patient would have wanted this to happen and, and if it's possible, we'd like to help facilitate and they've consented, the patient's taken to theater by the treating clinician and extubated in theater as you would normally um, on a morphine infusion. And then the transplant team is actually scrubbed and waiting in the anteroom. And this is to limit the warm ischemic time. Um, because the organs suffer damage if they're not getting oxygen and they're warm. And, and the procurement operations all try to cool down the organs as rapidly as they can. And one of two things can happen. Either the patient arrests, okay, within an hour of being extubated is our cutoff. In the UK, it's actually two hours. And after a period of five minutes with no spontaneous cardiac or respiratory effort, the treating clinician certifies the patient dead. And then the theater team proceeds with the operation to procure the organs, okay? 
or the patient does not arrest within an hour of being extubated. They're transferred to an end of life palliative care ward. The transplant team stands down and the family is informed that organ procurement was not possible. They obviously fully counseled to all the options prior to the, to the process, okay? And the transplant team needs to remain separate. It's the clinical team that would be palliating this patient as they would normally, um, and are not doing anything to hasten death. They're just letting nature take its course. And we are reliant on nature to take its course within a set time period, because you can't indefinitely book theater. The organs do suffer a degree of damage at this point um, because of this process of, of death in this case. Um, and that's why um, we only offer it at Crudisco Hospital and not doing remote retrievals for donation after circulatory death because that adds an extra cold ischemic time um, and it's quite often a foreign environment. Um, so we don't do that outside of Crudisco or Red Cross currently. Just to show you in the UK, if you look at the dark blue line, that's the deceased brain dead donors, and the yellow line is the increased in donors after circulatory death. And they have a similar sort of uh, issue with access to ICU beds in, as in South Africa. And you can see the light blue line is a lot more reliance on living donors as well. Okay, but about a third of deceased donors are now donors after circulatory death. So just to recap, the number of donors to be identified is greater than you think. Extended criteria donors offer a chance of transplantation to patients who wouldn't otherwise receive it. And donation after circulatory death does not violate the dead donor rule and helps further expand the donor pool. So let's cover brain death. Um, this is a 100% certainty uh, element in medicine. It's not like the birth of a child where you can get 50% and pass ONG and say, I've got a lovely baby, the other thing, not that one. You need to get 100% right for brain death. So no one has ever recovered from being correctly clinically certified brain dead. Invariably, the newspaper articles where you'll read of this recovery is either an error in communication or it's an error because somebody hasn't fully interpreted the preconditions for brain death, okay? They've been pulled from ice cold water. Then you can resuscitate someone up to an hour, two hours after they've been recovered, but they haven't met the criteria for clinical brain death testing because you have to meet certain prerequisites before you do it, okay? And I'll take you through those. So basically you need a coma, you need it, need it to be irreversible and the cause known, okay? And ideally you'd have neuroimaging that's compatible with that. It's very nice to be able to show the family a terrible CT scan, it adds an element of certainty to it, but you don't have to have it. If you've got a trans-hemispheric gunshot and the patient's 2T with no sedation on board, you have the clinical cause and you are certain about it, okay? Um, we're not interested in a referral where you can't tell us what the cause of death is. This would raise red flags. So we need to have a diagnosis. And I really think that organ donation sits at the top of the food chain in terms of you have to have explored all the options for your patient in order to make a referral to an organ donation team. Okay, And it adds a, a level of quality to the whole process. Need to be normothermic. Different countries use different cutoffs and South Africa's going to probably ratify 36 degrees centigrade, the critical care society as the, as the normothermia temperature to aim for, and a systolic blood pressure above actually 100 in the, in the South African guidelines that'll hopefully get published, or a mean arterial pressure above 60. You need to exclude significant metabolic, electrolyte, and endocrine abnormalities. That can be tricky because these all go to pot when someone's brain dead, um, and you need to have them within certain limits. So like a sodium needs to be under 160. It doesn't have to be plum normal in order to certify someone brain dead. But if the sodium is 180, you're not going to meet the criteria to be able to certify someone and you'd have to use some sort of ancillary testing. Um, also, you don't need to look for hypothyroidism or uh, an adrenal crisis as the cause if you already know what the cause is but you do need to exclude that the patient isn't hypoglycemic and, and fundamentals uh, um, before that. And if you don't have a cause for why the patient's in a coma, then you do need to start chasing those types of diagnoses. Um, in terms of sedative, analgesic, and neuro neuromuscular drug effects, these need to be excluded. Um, typically, we wait five times the half-life of a drug um, in order to be um, certain that that effect is gone. That's obviously in the context, you need to adjust that in the context of elderly patients and patients with abnormal organ function. But remember, you're gonna be testing the organ function prior to this because you want to assess what the quality of the organs are in the patient. And you should be looking after that while you're looking after the patient in ICU. So you should already know that. 
And then just in terms of the examination, pupils fixed and non-reactive. You want an absent corneal reflex. Don't scrape it with a needle. Someone might want the corneas. Um, no gag reflex. An absent cough reflex on deep suctioning down the tracheal tube. No facial grimace to supraorbital pain. Okay, an absence of motor response in all limbs. Notice the focus on facial grimace to supraorbital pain. A quadriplegic's not going to be very happy when you do a sternal rub and say, oh, he's not moving his limbs, he may be brain dead. Okay. The ocular vestibular reflex, okay, to use the cold caloric test. And then the new guidelines, the ocular cephalic reflex is actually a suboptimal stimulus. That's the doll's eye test. And um, if you are having to describe it in a tutorial, it's the doll, a brain dead doll is the one with the eyes drawn on by hand. Uh, those expensive dolls with the eye move, they actually have a brainstem reflex and are not technically brain dead. Um, and the cold caloric test is each ear with 50 mils of ice cold saline and you're looking for any sort of nystagmus or eye movement. And that's a, a quite severe stimulus on, on the midbrain. And then the final test is apnea testing. And just remember, you start with the most simple one. And if any of these are positive, your patient's not brain dead and you don't need to proceed to do the other ones, especially the apnea testing, as that can cause hemodynamic instability. Okay. But you need to prove that in the, the brainstem, there's no, in, in the setting of a raised CO2 and an altered pH, that there's no spontaneous respiration effort. This is deep wired into the brainstem. Um, Okay, so just in terms of apnea testing, all other brainstem tests in keeping with brain death, patient hemodynamically stable. They can be on adrenaline though, but they need to be stable on that dose of adrenaline. Pre-test ventilation, pr providing normal carbia, okay? And then you're gonna pre-oxygenate for 10 minutes, disconnect the ventilator, and then give oxygen, either via T piece at 50 liters a minute or via suction catheter down the ET tube at six liters per minute. I prefer to avoid all debate about the size of the suction catheter versus the size of the ET tube and the risks of a spontaneous pneumothorax by using the T-piece. And you're going to observe for spontaneous respirations. Arterial blood gas, typically drawn after 10 minutes or at the point where the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable. Because in order to prove it, you need to have a, a um, PCO2. Um, and I think these, the level, I must just double check it again. I think it's eight. 6.6. Um, I'll double check this for you guys because um, I think the slide is actually incorrect. The patient can be certified brain dead and the, and, and the time of death noted. Or if you see any spontaneous respirations, the patient's not brain dead. Okay. We don't do the apnea test on the ventilator because if you put it on spontaneous mode, uh, CPAP, um, they have safety triggers to deliberately ventilate the patient when they are apneic. Um, and we don't advocate going into the back end of the ventilators and disabling that safety setting just so you can do an apnea test maintaining a degree of PEEP. Um, remember to reconnect the ventilator with full support because hemodynamic collapse will uh, follow patients who aren't uh, breathing. Um, your pre-oxygenation only buys you a certain amount of time. And then you need to start planning the approach to the family with a multidisciplinary team. Okay. So just to discuss in children, another difficult circumstance, okay, there's different guidelines in various countries. The UK has actually now said that you can use adult criteria plus the rooting and the moro reflex um, in, in young children under one year um, to certify brain death and you don't need a different standard, but it's often a lot more emotional. So some people advocate repeat brain death stem testing in 24 hours um, requiring two intensivists to do the testing or advocate for routine ancillary testing. So just to discuss ancillary testing, atropine test, this is just actually a brainstem reflex. If you give atropine, it, it mediates the heart rate via the vagal nerve. So if you give it and it doesn't change, um, then the, the, the brainstem reflex is gone. Netcare actually requires that of their transplant coordinators um, to do it. It's required in Spain, but nowhere else, not, not really many other places in the world. Um, so it's not on the routine list of tests. Cerebral angiogram is the old fashioned de facto standard. Um, CT angiogram and MRI are often discussed. They're actually not standalone tests um, because they can't image the brainstem absolutely perfectly. Radionucleotide scanning is our preferred method um, in Kruderskia. 
EEG cannot be the sole test. It's not very sensitive and specific, around 70%. It's in lots of legal guidelines around the world, but it's actually not that good a test to mandate to be, to be added. Obviously, if it shows electrical activity of the brain, then the patient's not brain dead, but it's not very good at confirming it. And if you've got any sort of uh, repeating the clinical exam is another way to add a degree of rigor to the testing potentially. So that's just to show you a nuclear scan of a patient who is brain dead. The majority of mechanisms of brain death is actually the brain has swollen to the point that blood flow is not happening into the brain at all. And this patient's got a cerebral angiogram. Patient on the left for me is uh, still alive. Patient on the right is uh, definitely gonna be dead. Um, and this is just to show you an EEG, I can't interpret these um, because primarily there's lots of squiggles and they could be from other sources, not just the brain. So a lot gets said that, oh, well, we need the ventilators in our resource constraint settings for the next uh, patient to come on that we does have a prognosis. I just slipped this slide in because the life year gained from one deceased donor if you look at the, it does depend on the number of organs procured, but a heart, a liver, they both average around 15 years uh, survival for the recipients. Kidneys add nine years to each patient and is the, that receives one. Pancreas adds an extra three and lungs potentially up to eight years, okay? Remember, you can split liver and lungs to multiple recipients, but if you split liver in half, then you do compromise the outcome for the, for the recipient that would have got the, the whole organ. Um, but you can get generally about 10 years out and also lungs if you split them about five years each. That comes down to ethics about utilitarianism. Um, yeah. So what next? So you managed to certify the patient dead. Uh, what happens next? Well, it's not easy. And there is officially never a good time to ask a family for organ donation because they will always have just lost someone that they weren't expecting to lose, okay? So dealing with a family that's grieving is very difficult. And I think this is where something we can really get better in terms of how we communicate with families and how we hand over and actually let the transplant coordinator make the request. It's not just a question of quickly suss out the family's opinion to organ donation and I'll save the hassle. Um, I often tell the students, well, if I have to consent one for a patient for an amputation, they never say yes first up. Yes, doctor, please do that. It's always a discussion and, and a lot of organ donations actually just sit an end of life discussions are setting the scene to allow a family to discuss and let them get to the point of what next and, and so that they truly understand. And I think we often ask close ended questions and not open ended questions because we don't want to deal with the consequences of. Uh, so what do you understand by this? Um, because it, it often reflects that we haven't been effective in our communication. So best practice is early discussion with the transplant coordinator to clarify the potential for donation. I've mentioned that before. Plan your approach to the family. So have a full history, all the clinical details. If the family asks you about a CT scan done a week ago and you didn't know there was a CT scan done a week ago, that does not inspire confidence in the system. You need to identify key family members and relevant cultural and religious issues, okay? And you need to be aware of these because they are a big factor. You need to approach the family in a quiet setting, away from the patient's bedside, introduce everybody by name, and allow sufficient time for those close to the patient to understand the inevitability of the death or the anticipated death, okay, and spend time with the patient. Do not discuss organ donation at the first discussion, okay? These, these are not single discussions. Um, and you need to come back at a later date and fully assess what the family's understood by the discussion before making any sort of request. And ideally, it's to introduce the transplant coordinator and actually introduce them as a specialist nurse who supports families in this situation because they'll help the family regardless of whether they say yes or no, no to donation. They know about the morgue setup, about the post-mortem, um, and they can really they have facilitated regardless of what the decision is, okay? And they offer a really good service. And their job is to sit down and spend as much time as required to see whether we can get a family to consent to organ donation. Need to use clear and unambiguous language. Do not be apologetic. There's actually a study that says if you say sorry too many times, the family's less likely to support organ donation. They seem to think you're hiding something. Um, and you need to answer all questions and recognize that multiple discussions may be required to ensure understanding of the clinical situation, okay? 
we have had it introduced as the transplant coordinator and the family thought that their, their son was about to get a transplant to turn the situation around, not that he was potentially going to be the donor. So that's why I say introduce them as a specialist nurse. And we actually don't want the doctor, unless you're specifically trained in making these approaches to discuss organ donation. We may be forced to if the coordinator is busy somewhere else or you're at a remote location, but then they can give you advice over the phone on the best way to handle it. And how do you deal with a very religious family how do you deal with a family that's praying for a miracle? Um, how do you deal with a family that's just angry or completely shuts down and doesn't have any discussion? They, they, they are trained to deal with that type of situation. Um, I'm going to skip over this. This is just to show you the triggers that they use in the UK. Um, and also they actually use the decision made to perform brain death testing. So not at the point of I have certified this patient brain dead. If you've said oh, tomorrow morning we're going to certify this patient, um, that's actually the time that you need to have the discussion to assess the potential of donation. Okay. Um, because then you can go ahead with, with the full, full uh, motivation and, and a fully informed uh, opinion as to whether donation is truly possible. So what happens with a consented brain dead donor? Every effort, effort's made to minimize the impact of donor care on clinical service. The transplant coordinator manages the patient. We do have a space, we used to, in the PACU unit, um, if the trauma unit's markedly busy. And if we're getting a lung or a liver out of, the, out of the deal or a lung, then we would potentially put the patient into ICU to offer them full ICU support um, because we know the recipient's gonna go into that bed. Donor management, just remember that about 80% of brain dead donors have complete collapse within 72 hours. So the clock is still ticking, even with maximal support. You want to support all the organs. The only organ you can forget about is the brain at this point, and you can focus on all the other organs. Full ventilation, maintain a perfusing blood pressure, try and maintain an adequate urine output. Remember, if you flood the patient, you may compromise the lungs. If you give them too much adrenaline, you may compromise the heart. So it's a typical balancing act that we do for our, our ICU patients normally. Screening for infections is done by the transplant coordinator and also the tissue typing. Okay, all done by the transplant coordinator. Do make sure you keep really good uh, records. Um, for me, at end of life care, what was discussed, who was it discussed with, what was the result of that discussion, and was organ donation brought up, or was it uh, you know documented we're going to discuss with the transplant coordinator? Because if we don't do that, then we don't actually have a very good point to to improve our quality of care. So if you do all those things, you'll hopefully be able to pass it on. So my two take home messages are identify all potential donors and have a, a assessment of that donation potential made early. So refer early. It's greatly appreciated. It's certainly not going to waste. I think partly our difficulty in transplantation is that it feels remote from the, the teams that are doing it. And we do try and get the recipients to write anonymous letters. Um, but I think we could do better in terms of that type of feedback um yeah i like this one some people say this picture is a little bit too brutal and then just to show you i've got less than a minute to go but this is a uk and they did a potential donor audit and you can see they did a folder review of every single patient who died within 24 hours of being on a ventilator and in 26 percent, although the note said the patient was gcs 2t the patient wasn't tested for brain death and only four percent of those that were was there actually a medical contraindication to donation in 7%, although they had brain death and no medical contraindication, they didn't approach the family for consent. And they had a 36% refusal rate and 8% of the donors were too unstable to even make it to theatre to recover the organs. So you can see there's an attrition rate across the whole spectrum and we can really help influence that and, and all intervention programs try and reduce all these different steps along the way. I always refer patients at the end of life wherever donation is possible and wherever you can, try to get the transplant coordinator to make the approach for the request for donation um, and reserve the clinical team to being clear about the prognosis. But you need to have that discussion with them beforehand so that you, you, you don't uh, limit the options in terms of donation. Um, and I don't think organ donation is an outcome failure, but it's a positive reflection on the whole healthcare system and is an essential part of end-of-life care that should be offered routinely. So famous transplant recipients, I don't know if you know, but she's got a kidney transplant. I think she's onto a second kidney transplant, both living related. He's diabetic. He's also got a kidney transplant from 30 Rock. 
Steve Jobs, um, it often comes up for discussion, did he buy his liver transplant and what was his actual indication? Um, so he had a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas and tried alternative therapies for nine months before he went for a curative Whipple's operation. Unfortunately, he had multiple metastases later on in his liver. And that is actually a recognized uh, indication for transplantation. They're typically slow-growing tumors. Was he able to buy his organ? Uh, he was not, but he was able to be on multiple waiting lists because he had access to a private jet. So he could get to the hospital in time where he was the appropriate patient at the top of that waiting list. Um, so he actually got transplanted a six hour flight away from where he was living in, in Tennessee um, as opposed to California. Um, in South Africa, you have to choose which city you're in um, and uh, be on that waiting list. You're not allowed to be on multiple waiting lists around the country. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is that uh, money and being close to an urban center and a transplant center is an advantage when it comes to transplantation. So we had a patient in Uppington who was waiting for a liver transplant. And the logistics of trying to get a patient from Uppington when there's a donor within a 12-hour window are quite challenging. He ultimately did get a transplant, but he had to drive through the night to Cape Town in order to reach here in within a time limit that, that, that uh, worked out for him. Um, I don't know how we're going to cope with the uh, SAA uh, disappearing and getting to East London and back. We transplant patients from the Eastern Cape. And we would go and do the recovery operation there. I prefer recovery or procurement operation to the word harvest. Uh, but we would recover the organs there, bring them back to Cape Town, and we actually transplant the Eastern Cape dialysis patients. So they, they would come back as well. Jonah Lomu has got a kidney transplant. His one was put uh, in the orthotopic position, so not under the skin at the front on the iliac vessels to allow him to go back to playing contact sports. And then, of course, he's allowed to take steroids legally to uh, prevent rejection. Evil Knievel broke his leg uh, numerous times, five times, I think, his femur. Um, got multiple blood transfusions related to that and developed hepatitis C. He ended up with a liver transplant. Eric Abadal used to play soccer for Barcelona and got a liver transplant and went back to playing soccer. I think he got transferred to Monaco thereafter. And then Alonzo Mourning was fired by his basketball team. He's the guy at the back, uh, Shaquille O'Neal's in the front, uh, by the New Jersey Nets when he got diagnosed with renal failure um, and ultimately got a living donor kidney from his cousin. And you could get good quality of life and good return to sporting activity uh, with, a, with a transplant. Cool. Those are... So the people who actually have to give permission for organ donation to take place are the head of the medical facility where the donor is, so the medical superintendent, for the forensic pathologist. So they actually get asked to give consent, the family, okay? Um, and those are, the, those are the permissions that are required to proceed. Um, so what will happen is the case will be discussed by the transplant coordinator with the forensic pathologist. And the surgeons who recover the organs actually write an addendum to the post-mortem form for the forensic pathologist to say, look, we did the laparotomy, no trauma was found, or maybe we found a lung contusion. Um, so having to go for a forensic post-mortem is absolutely not any um, problem to proceed for organ donation. And that even goes for cases of iatrogenic problems in hospital as well. Um, or a complication of surgery, that doesn't preclude uh, organ donation. And I often think offering a family organ donation gives them some degree of closure. And even in families that say no, 90% of them are very thankful for the discussion having got to that point, uh, independent of their decision to support or not. Um, but I think it's quite paternalistic to deny the family that option as the clinician. Um, and I do think that it should be a standard of care that we, we routinely get to that point in all end of life discussions. Great, thank you. Cool. Any other questions? I'll ask a question. Um, yes. We, we, we actually did some organ recovery last year in George for a mm -hmm. man who fell off a ladder and sustained a, a catastrophic head injury. And I, I was quite impressed with the the time period between him coming to the hospital and that discussion being held. What, what is the, the longest time period that we have to wait before we make, uh, you know, we have a discussion with the family and say, listen, your, your, your relative has a really bad head injury. We would like to um, try and save other people's lives with an organ 
transplant. Because you spoke earlier about having surgeons scrubbed up in the ante room and ready, but you know that that, that requires the patient to be they are, they are going to pass away when they're extubated. So what happens if someone isn't going to pass away? They've just had a really bad head injury and the family are very upset, obviously. When, how, long, how long can we wait before we, we, we should stop waiting? I, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, so I, I, th I think I can uh, I unpack that. So, so if I gave you a clinical scenario, say a patient's got a GCS of 3T, he's got some brainstem reflexes, would you consider it for donation after circulatory death? Because you're pretty certain of the outcome at that point from a clinical viewpoint. Or would you wait for him to become brain dead and potentially certify him that way? And that would potentially allow more organs to be recovered. Um, so, so donation after circulatory death, there are scoring systems that you can use to predict. So obviously if a patient's on inotropes and you're stopping inotropes, then they're much more likely to arrest within that time period. If they desaturate very quickly during a spontaneous breathing trial, then you would also be able to predict that they would arrest relatively quickly. That's a very small subset of patients. It often gets touted in, uh, in the developing or the, the lower middle income country groups that this is uh, culturally much more accepted in terms of a definition of death. But actually, it's probably more to do with how the body is handled and, and dealing with those type of questions that, that results in, in, in our low consent rate. Um, that, that we need to address those issues in terms of burials and things rather than actually the, the pedantics of the definition of death. Um, so in terms of time period, we, we use one hour for donation after circulatory death, um, and that would be in the setting of where you would be routinely palliating with, with an extubation and stopping all active therapy. And then for brain death, uh, um, the window is as long as you can maintain the patient. So typically it takes about 16 hours to arrange all the logistics for a brain death donor. Cause if you imagine the heart recipient's got to come in the lung, the liver recipient, there's an awful lot of logistics that is happening to prep all these different theaters around the, around the world because around the country, because they want to start at a, at a time that would minimize the cold ischemic time. Um, and there are windows for various organs. So a heart should ideally be transplanted within two hours. Um, so to come from George, everything needs to be lined up that as that donor operation is just finishing, the recipient operation is actually starting in Cape Town if the heart was to come back here. So there's a lot of uh, logistics that go on. Um, and typically they take a bit of time. The tissue typing for kidneys, because they're very immunogenic and you want to give them to the person where they're going to last the longest, um, is typically takes about nine hours and they sit there testing the blood, seeing what the degree of the reaction is, quantifying it so that we can make an informed call for that. So also being able to send off the tissue typing, um, you know, while at the start of this process of managing a brain dead donor allows that process to not impact the cold ischemic time. For kidneys, you've got 24 to maybe an absolute maximum of 36 hours to transplant the kidneys. But the longer you wait, the, the more chance those recipients will need dialysis in the hospital. Um, lungs is about six hours, liver ideally six hours as well. Um, so those are sort of the time cutoffs that the recipient teams are looking at. Um, and then it does come down to what your resources are available. So, so for me, asking a team to manage a donor overnight, um, even in a resource constrained environment is appropriate because of the number of people who can benefit over many, many life years. If you, if you add it up, it's about 54 life years gained from a multi-organ donor. And there's not many patients I'm admitting into my adult ICU for just 24 hours who are going to live for an extra 54 years. And those are just the averages for those organs. Uh, some people it's shorter, some people it's obviously much longer. Um, so, so that would be my take on it. If you, if you can, and the patient's obviously got a trajectory with the swelling in their brain, maybe wait morning and trying to certify them brain dead. The guidelines for discussions with family, in the international guidelines, they call it accommodation and how much time do you give a family to come to terms with the death. Um, and we actually set 24 hours as, as an appropriate time frame to take a family through a counseling process um, and allow them to come to terms with, with brain death um, in terms of accommodating the family. Obviously, you would aim to try and be a little bit quicker, but uh, I think it is definitely a process. 
Um, and I don't think it's inappropriate to maintain someone while offering good end of life care to make sure all the options are explored. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, stay safe.